Good afternoon. Oh, I can't hear you guys. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Excellent. I'm Colonel Dave Gray. I'm the director for the Center of Leadership and Ethics, and I'll be the master of ceremonies for the 29th Annual Environment Virginia Conference. I want to welcome you all to the conference, and I want to thank you for coming today uh, for the breakout sessions, and I especially want to recognize the Department of uh, Environmental Quality on their 25th anniversary. Let's give them a hand. We're always very proud to have as our host of this conference and meet with our partners throughout the year to put the conference together. So I'd like to recognize our co-hosts, the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality, the Department of Converse Conservation and Recreation, and the Virginia Environmental Endowment. Please give them a hand. Now we're honored tonight to kick off just prior to the reception uh, to have two of Governor, Governor Northam's cabinet members here to make a few opening remarks. Uh, Secretary Ring and Secretary Strickler. They've assured me that they'll be brief, but they are willing to undergo that gauntlet of fire and answer any questions you might have uh, starting out um, at the end of this. So we're going to begin tonight with some remarks by the new Secretary of Agriculture and Forestry, Ms. Bettina Ring. Ms. Ring was appointed this year to serve as the fourth Secretary of Agriculture and Forestry for the Commonwealth of Virginia. In this capacity, she supports the governor's mission of building a strong Virginia economy in agriculture and forestry, two of Virginia's largest private industries. Prior to her appointment as Secretary, uh, Ms. Ring was appointed by former Governor Terry McAuliffe to serve as the seventh state forester of the Virginia Department of Forestry. And during her term, she uh, secured $27 million in funding for emergency response equipment used to fight forest fires and assist localities and state agencies. She is a Virginia native and began her career with the Virginia Department of Forestry, where she's held a number of leadership positions. Prior to that, she was a senior vice president of family forests at the American Forest Foundation, served on the Federal Forest Resource Coordinating Committee, and that is a committee that represents the U.S. Department of Agriculture with the private sector. She served as the executive director of the Bay Area Open Space Council in San Francisco and was the executive director of the Colorado Coalition of Land Trusts. She holds a Bachelor in Science in Forestry and Wildlife from Virginia Tech and a Master's of Business Administration from James Madison. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Bettina Ring. Thank you for that kind introduction, Colonel Gray. It's a pleasure to be here this evening, and I was warned to keep my remarks brief, um, that there would be a lot of background noise, everyone sort of milling about waiting to, um, for the bar to open, but you all are being very well behaved this evening, uh, which will further incentivize me to, to keep my remark, remark short um, as a reward. But it is a true pleasure to be here, to see so many of you uh, turn out this evening um, and to be here for the next couple days. As we show our commitment to the environment here in Virginia and to a robust economy and how we can work together to work through the challenges that we have before us and to seize the opportunities that are in front of us as well. It's certainly my pleasure to work side by side with Secretary Strickler 
and his team. And um, our agencies, the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, the Department of Forestry, and the Racing Commission all stand uh, ready and willing to walk hand in hand as we do all that we can to ensure that we have a strong economy. And we'll both be talking about, as well as Governor Northam tomorrow, what that economy looks like and how it truly depends on protection of the environment and our natural resources. But we work so closely together, our sister, our agencies, and, and then Secretary Strickler and I are making every effort to try to meet on a regular basis to make sure that we're walking side by side as we do our work and that we are working in an integrated fashion. Uh, just a few things I'd like to touch on, and it was mentioned that certainly agriculture and forestry, they are our top industries here in the state. Agriculture number one, forestry number three, just behind tourism, and when combined, it's $91 billion annually to the economy and over 450,000 jobs that are um, really depending on both a robust and sustainable agriculture and, and forestry economy. As we look at the future, we have some challenges before us, certainly, but we want to continue to promote our great products here in Virginia and our wonderful built businesses and keep them healthy and to promote them both domestically and abroad because having a healthy economy allows us to have more resources to also protect our environment, and it all goes hand in hand, as I mentioned. We need to make sure that we're protecting um, having sustainable ag land and forest land across the state, and that really depends on us working closely with our farmers and our forest landowners to retain that farmland and forest land. And that takes many tools in that toolbox, from financial incentives and tax incentives, conservation easements for those um, that it works for, and thinking about estate and transition planning and make sh making sure that our landowners and our families have the tools that they need to keep that land in their families and to make sure that we're recognizing them for the good work that they're doing through programs such as the Century Farm Program and the Century Forest Programs, really lift them up and to lift up those model businesses that are doing a great job of growing the economy and protecting our environment making sure that we're continuing to enhance the great hardwood forests we have across the state as we ensure that we have a sustainable pine forest as well. How do we make sure that we continue to restore the diminished ecosystems? And that's one place we work very closely with our natural resource agencies um, as it relates to longleaf restoration. We have a great story to tell being the most northern range for longleaf, and we'll have more to share as we continue to expand that here in the state. We have a strong track record of protecting the waters here in the state, and especially the Chesapeake Bay. When we look at our civil cultural water quality program that the Department of Forestry administers, when we look at the good work that we've been doing with the agricultural stakeholders across the state, working closely with soil and water conservation districts and making sure that we have uh, the resources that we need for ag BMPs, we need to make sure that we're continuing to fund that as we move forward but we need to hold up those farmers and landowners that have been doing a great job. I would like to recognize Greg Evans in the audience uh, who has um, been doing such a great job at the Department of Forestry that I recently borrowed him and pulled him into our secretariat. He's been leading our Healthy Watersheds and TMDL project and many of you have been walking with us on that journey, have been partners um, that are here in the audience and we're excited about where we are with this project and I wanted to elevate the visibility of that project, but also to have his brain nearby so that we continue, could continue to do the great work that we've been doing together. And so I appreciate his leadership and just want to recognize him today for that. I want to share just a quick update, and I know Greg gave a little teaser this afternoon in his session, and there'll be more to share tomorrow. But where we are with this TMDL forest retention project is very exciting. And it really has led to a decision uh, by the Chesapeake Bay jurisdictions this past December that credits conservation in the TMDL for the first time ever and for the first time in this country. So we're pretty uh, pleased with that and we had made some great progress working with our partners at Farm Bureau and else, elsewhere uh, to work with Delegate Hodges and the General Assembly and his colleagues to be able to advance and address some land use issues that we've had to be able to strengthen our opportunities to retain forest land and we look forward to working with Senator Hanger and others in the Senate to really begin to address the financial aspects 
as it relates to land use and some of the challenges and barriers we have in front of us. We're excited that the phase, the third phase of our project was just funded by EPA, and this Friday we hope to hear from the U.S. Endowment for Forests and Communities that will also be receiving additional funding from them. We're happy to report um, that we're gonna be able to focus on, because of this additional funding, three areas. Working with two communities within the Rappahannock River Basin to undertake a complete review of comprehensive plans, policies, and zoning ordinances with the goal of revising them to stimulate forest land retention while also achieving economic benefits and then share what we've learned with other juris jurisdictions within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Working with the private financial sector to develop and test a financing model that will aggregate demand, reduce the transaction complexities and structure a return on investment that will enable us to achieve the scale that we need as it relates to forest land and farmland retention moving forward. And tomorrow we have a panel where we'll be discussing this in more detail. And collaborate, collaborating closely with the Chesapeake Bay program work groups to make sure that we're doing all that we can to institutionalize the lessons that we've learned. How do we create a new paradigm moving forward? How do we think about these conservation and economic goals and how uh, they're intertwined? So tomorrow you'll be hearing from Governor Northam. He's excited about being here, being back, back at um, BMI. And he's gonna be sharing a bold vision that he has and some new initiatives that are in front of us. We look forward to participating in this session. Both Matt and I will be here through noon on Thursday. And we look forward to listening to you about some of the issues and challenges we have, some of the concerns, but also those opportunities. We both believe in solutions and finding a way to find yes, saying yes to those things that we need to say yes to, and then finding the resources that we need to make that possible. So I'm excited to be working with all of you to ensure that we develop new partnerships, that we strengthen existing relationships, that we try to be more strategic and intentional about our work to ensure that we have more impact on the land and with each other, and that we do all that we can to ensure that we have healthy people, that we have healthy land, and that we have healthy communities across the Commonwealth. Thank you very much and um, look forward to uh, spending some time with you this evening. Thank you, Secretary Ring, for those great remarks. Uh, we are so fortunate also to have Virginia's newest Secretary of Natural Resources, Matthew Strickler, here with us this evening. Prior to joining the administration, he served as Senior Policy Advisor to Democratic members of the House of Representatives Committee on Natural Resources. Originally from Lexington, Virginia, welcome home. Matt graduated from Washington and Lee. I was gonna say some other university, but Washington and Lee University next door and holds a master's degree in public policy and marine science from the College of William and Mary and the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. He was a NOS Marine Policy Fellow in NOAA's Office of International Affairs in 2007 and worked on Senator Mark Warner's successful 2008 campaign. Immediately prior to his time on Capitol Hill, Matt worked in the Virginia General Assembly as a legislative assistant to then State Senator Ralph Northam. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Matthew Strickler. Good afternoon. Thank you, Colonel Gray, for, uh, for that kind introduction. And uh, thanks to, to all of you for the opportunity to, to be here with you this week. And, and thanks, of course, to VMI for once again hosting this very special gathering. Um, I recognize that I'm now the only thing between uh, all of you and cocktail hour, so I'll keep it brief. Uh, I'm Matt Strickler. I have the privilege of serving as Governor Northam's Secretary of Natural Resources. I also happen to be the only member of Governor Northam's cabinet. Uh, who was born and raised in Lexington and Rockbridge County. So it's great to be back in my hometown, uh, in the place where I decided I wanted to have a career in public service and where I learned so much about how our economy and our quality of life depend on, quality of life depend on thoughtful science-based management of our environment and natural resources. I was fortunate to have great teachers growing up at Lower Downing Middle School here in town, as well as Rockbridge High 
and Washington Lee. Um, and of course, my parents, Doris, who is not able to be here today, uh, and Mike Strickler, who's standing right over there. Thanks, Dad. Uh, I'm also incredibly fortunate uh, to work for a governor who sees the environment as a top-tier priority and not just an afterthought. Uh, I first met Governor Northam shortly after I'd finished my graduate work at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science uh, and had a postgraduate fellowship at NOAA. Uh, I was completely blown away by his respect for science, for his understanding of how pollution impacts public health and our quality of life, and of course his dedication to cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay. That was enough to convince me to go to work for him, which I did as a legislative assistant for him in the state senate for almost four years. Um, and the folks at DQ have heard all this on Monday when I was talking at their, their event, but, but it was clear that he had the qualities you really need to become a, a true political leader. And I thought, you know, if we could ever get this guy elected governor, imagine all the good we could do for, for Virginia's environment. And so here we are. Um, and that's really exciting for me and, and the governor as well. I can't tell you how excited I am for the opportunities we have over the next several years uh, working together and, and including implementing some of the legislation we negotiated with the General Assembly this past session. Bills the governor signed will dramatically increase energy efficiency and the use of solar and wind power in the Commonwealth, chart a course for cleaning up leaking coal ash ponds, and enhance the Department of Environmental Quality's ability to stop pipeline construction activities that are damaging the environment. Uh, most of the good material that I wrote for this week is going to be in the governor's speech tomorrow, so you're, you're left with this. Uh, and I don't want to give away all the themes of his, uh, his keynote address, but, but I will say that the governor's laser focused on, on tackling big conservation challenges like bay cleanup, land conservation, and of course climate change. He believes that doing that is going to make our economy stronger, not weaker, and will continue to foster the growth of industries that are producing more of the goods and services people want with less of the pollution they don't want. He believes the level playing field created by sound environmental rules has increased demand for cons from consumers and businesses for environmentally friendly products, from food to transportation to energy to building materials. And that's helping us find better ways of doing things, driving innovation and creating jobs. And he believes that Virginia can and should be a leader in showing that an economy based on the concept of sustainable economic development, development that meets the needs of the current generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs is within our grasp. So I'm excited to work with all of you to help implement Governor Northam's vision for a cleaner, more productive, and more resilient Virginia. I'm also excited about the great team we've assembled in Richmond, including, of course, Secretary uh, Ring, uh, and a couple folks on my team that I want to uh, acknowledge. Uh, Ann Jennings, my Deputy Secretary, who is over here. Anne is, uh, Anne is fantastic, uh, is a font of knowledge on everything related to the Chesapeake Bay uh, and our oceans and coasts in particular, uh, and, and could not do any of the work we have to do in that important area without, uh, without Anne here. So I also would like to, uh, to recognize uh, Angela Navarro, our other Deputy Secretary in the office. Angela is our energy policy guru uh, and also plays a huge role in our, uh, our land conservation efforts. Uh, and those two are really the brains behind the operation. So, uh, so thank you all for being here and, and all the work that you do. Um, that's about all I have. Look forward to talking with all of you this week. Uh, happy to take any questions and, and do the best I can to answer them. And, and hopefully I'll get some help from Secretary Rang. Thank you. Nan Gray. I'm a licensed professional soil scientist. And welcome both of you to the administration. And I look forward to having you do all these great things, especially for agriculture. I grew local, organic, mountain growing asparagus for 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it's very, very healthy for you. 20 years, it's a 12-year crop. You may know that. You put it in the ground and it produces. Um, as a soil scientist and my, hus my husband's an entomologist, we looked at everything the crop was producing and we met its needs. We 
we kept that soil so healthy that it was able to go for 20 years. As a farmer, uh, that was golden. Then I got a fungus, wiped it out, boom, gone, overnight. Well, actually, a year. Now my options as a farmer are becoming more limited, mind you. How can I give people something for their bodies to make them live well? I am a farmer. My crops are changing. The weather is changing. We have more problems with insects. I know we have invasive species talk in here. The other thing is, uh, I want to touch this publicly to say I am totally against destroying over 3,000 acres of prime agricultural land for Mountain Valley Pipeline because you cannot bring back soils that are destroyed, period. So justify to me how when 2050, the year 2050 comes around and we have over 9 billion people to feed in this planet, why would we do something like destroy productive prime agricultural land? And as you know, prime agricultural land is just as important as prime forest land. We must not destroy this land. It's a bad trade-off. Broken soils are dead soils. You keep the soils whole, you'll have prime agricultural land that you can use for many, many, many generations. Thank you. Sure, um, so we're going to sort of split this up. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer that it all begins with soil. So I would love to talk to you about soils. And I appreciate your work in soils. Um, we, we need more of that across the state. And um, just last week, I was at a small farm in Albemarle County and was meeting um, with the uh, director of the um, biological Farming, Biodynamic Farming Association, and um, he does soil consulting work. So a, a bit of a tangent, but I, I do believe that making sure that we have healthy soils is extremely important. And uh, we know that we have great land stewards across the state, private land stewards as well as public land stewards that are doing all they can to ensure uh, that we continue to work with those soils and that we keep them healthy long term. Uh, we're trying to look at, and Matt's going to address uh, more of your issues around um, linear mitigation. Um, we are trying to uh, look to the future and make sure that we have productive farmlands across the state. And it takes, again, various tools to be able to make that happen. Uh, we, um, in Virginia, have um, also strong private property rights that um, are a piece of the equation as well as we look at uh, decisions that are being, being made um, in the future. And so we have to think through and have discussions. We have to have the right processes in place that allow us to make the most informed decisions we can as a commonwealth. And we're going to continue to work through those challenges together. Uh, but um, I would love to talk to you more, more about soils, uh, because I've become a bit of a nerd when it comes to talking about soils management. So Matt. Um, Nan, thank you for your, your question. Um, you know, these pipeline projects are, are very challenging. Um, they're challenging for me, they're challenging for the governor, and, and I, I know how challenging they are for many of the people in this room who are, who are environmentalists, and f obviously for the people whose, uh, whose lands they're proposed to cross. Um, you know, I, I want you all to know, and I know I've talked to a number of you in this room about this, that, that we as a commonwealth, and, and Governor Northam uh, is personally committed to doing everything we can that's within our purview to, you know, to, to make sure that these, these projects, if they go forward, are not having negative impacts on, on Virginia's environment. Um, we pledge that to you. We'll continue to, to work together with you all um, on, on, that, you know, on that shared goal. Uh, Secretary Rang mentioned, mentioned mitigation. Um, the previous administration uh, negotiated and, and we have signed off on, on tens of millions of dollars of mitigation funding for uh, the forest fragmentation impacts uh, in particular that we're going to put towards uh, you know, projects that will enhance Virginia's environmental quality. Um, the, the thing that I, I, I maybe wish that I had uh, the ability to control, but, but I don't, um, I don't have the ability to determine whether or not these projects are in the public need. That's a federal decision. I don't have the ability to determine what the route of these pipelines 
are. That's also a, a federal decision. So what we have to look at is, is what our authority is at the state level, uh, and that is mostly related to uh, the, the timber piece, which we've already discussed as far as, as mitigation, um, and, and water quality. Um, and Governor Northam uh, has, has you know, directed DEQ, and DEQ has put out uh, what I think is, is the most uh, comprehensive monitoring compliance uh, and enforcement program for any uh, construction projects in the history of the Commonwealth of Virginia. DEQ was already, um, had already put in place a, uh, a more stringent review process for, uh, for these pipeline projects than anything we've, we've ever seen in the state. So we are, we are doing our level best to make sure that these projects, uh, if, they, if they are constructed, if the companies uh, and the partners can meet um, you know, the, the kind of baseline level of, of surety that they have to offer us, that, that, that any construction that happens um, is very protective of the environment, and if it's not, we have the authority to stop it. Um, we, we passed two bills, the governor signed two bills um, uh, introduced by Senator Deeds this uh, General Assembly session that enhanced DEQ's stop work authority, or stop work order authority, so they have the ability now, uh, if they see something going crosswise uh, with one of these projects, that they can step in and put the brakes on it. So we're, we're, we're happy for that, we're happy, we're, we hope we don't have to use it. Um, there may be situations where we do, um, and, and we'll be ready to if, if that situation arises. So I know that, that that's not the, the answer that a lot of folks wanna hear, is, you know, folks, uh, many folks out there uh, don't wanna see these projects constructed at all, and, and I get that. Um, but you know, we're, as a Commonwealth, doing, doing uh, as, as much as we can here, and we'll continue to. I just want to speak to the uh, broad swath of environmentalists here. I include myself <clears throat> among them. Uh, I'm in Spotsylvania County, and uh, S. Power has proposed the 12th largest solar power plant, half the size of Manhattan, right around a neighborhood. Now, we want to make sure that the State Corporation Commission, and I'm a respondent there, <coughs> and have asked them to put on environmental conditions. And I hope everyone from the governor's office to DEQ to the Spotsylvania local governing agencies will make sure that no Virginians are harmed. How? 1.3 billion gallons out of a local, already shaky aquifer. Our solar expert says, will take away the drinking water from thousands of people in spots of any county. The soil, think about it, over entire city of Fredericksburg laid bare with storm water. All of this has to be mitigated ahead of time. This is not a Walmart coming in. Unfortunately, when we're talking about the smaller solar sites, this one contains all of the 74 solar sites already in Virginia. That's how big it is. So this is just the first. This probably won't be the last, but this gives all of these governing agencies a duty to make sure that this is environmentally safe and that the water is not going to evaporate that the lake I fish on is not going to have its springs impaired, which our expert says it will if, it, if, if they do take that kind of drilling uh, well out of the aquifer. So that's just one of the issues. There are dozens of them, and 
as a respondent, you can all go to the website, the State Corporation Commission, or the S Power 500 watt solar. And this is a precedent now. This is a precedent setting. This is the first solar of this size on the East Coast. All of the other solar power plants are miles away from individuals in the Southwest in the US. This is the first on the East Coast. And so I, I plead to all the individuals involved, and there's many here, and I've spoken with many of them, and I appreciate your time. But I hope you will take the time to read uh, my request to the State Corporation Commission to put on conditions to keep people from being harmed. And we look to you, Matt, and all of your office and all of the agencies in the state to make sure that if and when this goes through, that we don't have an environmental disaster 1.8 million solar panels are involved. And I want to know when they're spent or they're broken. We've had two, we've had a hurricane and two tornadoes right in that area, taking down many of the trees and harm my own neighborhood. Think about what happens when the solar panels uh, are impacted by that kind of a weather event. Look at the pictures in Puerto Rico and so on you'll see the impact. So we have to have plans ahead of time to make a big company and, and make the, the company who wants to buy that power, Microsoft, aware of these dangers and make sure that there is no adverse environment impact. And thank you for your time. Thank you for that. I, I can just respond um, briefly. A as you know, and, and, and some in this room may or may not, the State Corporation Commission is an, an independent uh, you know, government agency. The, the governor doesn't um, dictate to the SEC how they, they do their job of, of utility regulation. That said, um, the, the issues that you brought up of, of groundwater and stormwater are you know, at the forefront of our mind, at the forefront of, of GEQ's mind, and, and, and subject to their regulations for, for any development projects um, of, of this kind of scale. And that includes renewable energy. We love wind and solar. The governor loves wind and solar. But we certainly uh, want to make sure that those kinds of projects are conducted in, or constructed in an environmentally sensitive way as well. So thank you for that, and we'll, we'll be on top of it. So on behalf of the superintendent, our four of cadets, and our staff and faculty, I'd like to thank you again for coming and opening the conference with some great insights about the environment and the way ahead. We thank you for coming home. Okay, the bars are open.